come before us. God bless their hearts. God strengthen them. Amen. Amen. Turn with us this morning to the uh, same passage, really, that we've been utilizing for the past few weeks as we continue in this Lenten season and seeing what it is that the Lord would have us to observe and to follow. From Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 40, these words from Jeremiah, let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. And the subject this morning, along with our theme, the theme is sacrifice. The subject is contrition gets God's attention. Contrition gets God's attention. As we've been looking at what it takes to reestablish a relationship with the Lord, or maybe you have a good relationship already, but it can be better. Uh, there's always room for improvement. Uh, we can all get stronger uh, than, than what we are today. And uh, that takes repentance. Uh, we looked last week on the element of confession. And that is one of the elements that's involved in repentance. And uh, we want to add to that uh, on today. And that is repentance involves not only confession, but it involves contrition. Contrition. Contrition is a word we don't hear a lot of and uh, sounds like a strange word or a, a foreign term, but it really comes from the word contrite. C O N T R I T E, contrite. And that word simply means uh, sorrow or to be sorry. Sorrow for having sin. That's what contrition is about. Sorrow expressed for having rebelled against God. That's contrition. Contrition arises out of love for God. If indeed we do love God. Contrition is added to that part of repentance. To illustrate this point, in the book of 1 Samuel that was read earlier, the 15th chapter, we find that uh, God had given a command to King Saul. Saul was the first king of the Israelites. And God gave him a command, and it was because God's judgment had come upon the Amalekites. And it was the Amalekites who had mistreated God's people some years prior to this, and their sins had really become no better. And so God was pronouncing judgment upon the people of Amalek or the Amalekites. And uh, uh, the word that God gave to Samuel to give to Saul was to utterly destroy the Amalekites. Uh, there in 1 Samuel again, chapter 15, verses 2 and 3, Samuel the prophet says to King Saul, thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek 
for what he did to Israel. He's talking about the Amalekites, the people, and how he ambushed him, my people, on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them. Judgment, judgment, see. But kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Go in and just destroy the land, for my judgment has come against them. Saul received that word and did go in and attack uh, the Amalekites. But rather than doing uh, everything that God had instructed, uh, we find that Saul and uh, the army, Saul's people, the people of Israel, they spared the king of uh, the Amalekites, and that was Agag. And uh, they also took the best of the animals that were left there in the land. Verses 8 and 9 says that he also took, talking about Saul, took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. God said, destroy everything and utterly destroy all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. Well, we find that ultimately Samuel came upon the instruction of God and Samuel confronted Saul. And Samuel uh, uh, said to him, we can look at verse uh, uh, 12 and forward, when Samuel arose in the morning to meet Saul, uh, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel and indeed set up a monument for himself. And he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? You say and you're bragging that you have done everything that, that the Lord told you to do. You were to destroy all of the animals, but what is this bad that I hear? Uh, the bleeding of the sheep, and what is the moo, -moo that I hear from uh, all of the cattle? Saul said, uh, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to your God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Ultimately, uh, uh, Samuel doesn't let Saul get off the hook and try to use uh, the excuses that he is endeavoring to use Saul asked him, why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites in verse 21, he says, But the people took of the plunder, sheep with oxen and uh, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to God. I know God said to destroy everything, but we kept the best uh, uh, so that we could sacrifice them to God. 
and I've done, Saul is essentially saying, everything that God indeed has told me to do. And Samuel continuing his confrontation with him in verses 22 and 23, Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. It is, it is uh, uh, that, that some folk think they are impressing God with all of their good things that they say they are doing, when in essence they are just doing what they want to do and offering sacrifices in the manner that they want to offer them while thinking they are still getting by with sinning against God. It is of what Samuel is saying that obedience is better than sacrifice. Oh, you can't come before God and say, uh, I'll continue in sin as long as I just come to church. Uh, uh, that's my sacrifice in coming to church. Uh, I'll continue in sin and I'll sacrifice my offering, uh, but I'll keep doing what it is that I want to do. I'll, I'll stay in sin and, 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 and commit those things that are pleasant and pleasurable for me, but I'll give God, I'll give God my time, and I'll give him my tithes, and I'll give him my talents. No, no, Samuel saying, that, that doesn't work. Uh, that doesn't work. Obedience is better than sacrifice. In other words, what we are to sacrifice to the Lord is obedience from the heart. That's what God is looking at, uh, not just in what you give him, not just what Saul was putting on the burnt offering. Samuel saying, no, God is looking at the heart. He's looking at the heart. And so we find that ultimately Saul confesses. He confesses. In verses 24 and 25, then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, but I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. That is still going on today. Don't you know that's going on and has been going on in every generation that there are those in position of leadership who say what the people want them to say and do what the people want them to do. That's, that's why the Lord has said in the scriptures and throughout the pages of his word, uh, talking about things that would go on through time, even to the last days and to the end of time. He said that this type of thing indeed would be going on where people will say, false prophets will say what the people want to hear and they will do what the people want to be done. Samuel is saying that's not what God is looking at. Uh, he's not approving of that type of thing. Not only from the prophets who want to deceive the people and the people, the people, when it comes down to it, some people love to be deceived. We find it happening in other areas of life. It's not just with the false prophets. It's with false politicians, even. Those in position of leadership. I want you to understand something. When it comes to being leaders, of God's people and everybody the world over. Everybody's God's people. Everybody has to have leaders. God appoints 
and he anoints leaders in the church, and he anoints them even in the government. Now, if you don't think I'm telling the truth, sometimes when you get home, and not just sometimes, as soon as you get home, read, read uh, the 13th chapter of the book of Romans, uh, where it talks about uh, Paul is saying how uh, the government officials are appointed and they're anointed by God uh, to do the things that are right. But you're going to find, uh, as with the government, you find the same thing in the church, that there are those, just like Saul was doing, in a position of leadership who do the things that they feel are right, uh, do the things that they think, uh, 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 according to their own standards, uh, the way that things ought to go, rather than being obedient to the Word of God, to the Word of God. This is what... Saul, uh, Saul was guilty of, and it's what Samuel was confronting him about, uh, that you're doing the things, you're saying the things, just to please the people, just to do what people want you to do, just to get votes so that you can stay in office, so you can seemingly make folk happy, so that you can do it regardless of where it is. That's not what God is looking for we find that Saul confessed, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, Samuel, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Anytime you start to fear people more than you fear God, you're in, uh, as some folks say, a male of a hest. When, when you think, that, that you can get by just because uh, you're, you're giving in to folk. You get yourself in serious trouble. Saul said in verse 25, Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. We find that Saul confessed, but it wasn't enough. We see his confession, but we fail to see contrition. We see him acknowledge that he had sinned, but we don't see him really being sorry that he had sinned. This is not the first time this had occurred with Saul. We find in some of the previous chapters, and even in chapters after this in 1 Samuel, of just what Saul does again and again, just because he wants to do what he feels is right, not what God says is right. He showed no sorry, no sorrow for his sin. The only thing he was seemingly sorry for was that he got caught. The sheep gave him away, and, and the cattle gave him away, and Agag gave him away. He asked in the 25th verse, Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord. The Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. True repentance, church, involves confession and contrition. Sorrow for sinning against God, sorrow for rebelling against God, sorrow out of love for God. This, we find, uh, happened with the lives of others in the scriptures, and David himself as uh, 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 Minister Parker brought out in the Sunday school lesson this morning again about David using that example of uh, the great sin that he had committed, uh, among other things, but this one committing adultery and having the, the husband of Bathsheba killed and, and taking her then to be his wife. But when he was confronted, 
for the sin that he had committed, he had to repent. And we find that David did repent. Look in the 51st Psalm. You don't have to look at all of that now. Read that when you get home too. Uh, when you read uh, Romans 13 chapter, read Psalm chapter 51. And Brother Thomas, if you can project just a few of those verses there. In Psalm 51 verses 3 through 4 and 16 through 17, that whole Psalm is just good. If ever you really want to get right with God, if, 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 if your conscience is bothering you because of sin and you want to repent, you read that 51st Psalm. But just some points that I want to take from it. David said, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you. You only, it's talking to God, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. I acknowledge my sins, but look at what else David says. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. He said, you do not delight in burnt offerings. I can burn every animal on the face of the earth, David is saying, but it would not be enough just to acknowledge that I've sinned and then burn up all the animals. He said, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh Lord, you will not despise. Or oh, I tell you, God, God's attention is, is, is touched when you're contrite and when you have contrition, when you're sorry for your sin. It's not enough just to say, I'm guilty, and then secretly say, but oh, I had a good time. Uh, it's not enough to say, oh, I'm guilty over and over, and I'm going to do it again. Not repentance, it's turning from it and being sorry that you did it in the first place. David goes on to say, further in the Psalm of the next passage that I have, I believe in Psalm 34 and verse 18, David says in this 34th Psalm, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. God saves those who have a contrite spirit. Look at what God says himself in the book of Isaiah. We have a couple of passages there in Isaiah 57 and 15. For thus says the high and lofty one, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. God is saying himself, though I inhabit eternity, in other words, the whole earth is mine, my name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, yet I also dwell with him who has a sorrowful spirit, a contrite and a humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Isaiah also says, as God is speaking, in Isaiah 66, verses 1 through 2, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? In other words, what are you going to do to try to impress God with, with, with who you think you are, with your abilities, and with all the talent that you may think you have? God says, where is the place of my rest? He says, for all those things my hand has made. There's nothing you can make, God is saying, that I haven't provided for. There's nothing you can make that I've already made. Don't try to impress me with all of those things. He said, uh, uh, my hands have made them all. All of these things in this, says the Lord. But on this one will I look. This is who gets my attention, God said. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. The one who obeys my word and is sorrowful for sins 
that have been committed. Oh, church, contrition gets God's attention. Don't just take my word for it. Listen, listen to Peter. Peter thought he could get by it, trying to impress God, trying to uh, impress Jesus. When Jesus said, when it was going to the cross, uh, uh, telling the disciples, on this night, all of you, he said, are going to be offended. All of you are, are going to stumble. All of you are going to scatter. And, 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 and it's because of me. Peter said, no, no, uh, Jesus, now, uh, don't, don't talk that way. Don't think that way. Uh, I'll, I'll go with you now. Uh, I, I won't run, and, and I won't be one who will be offended uh, just because of you. I'm not going to stumble when the trouble comes and when the fire gets hot. Oh, oh, I'm with you all the way. I'm your boy. I've got your back. Jesus. Jesus said, uh, no, Peter, he said, you're going to run just like everybody else. He said, on this night before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. You're going to say that you don't even know me. Peter said, not me, not me, Jesus. Uh -uh. He said, even if it means my life, if everybody runs, I'm not going to run. And the word says, so said all the disciples. But we know what happened when, when the, uh, the officers came to arrest Jesus. All of them ran. All of them fled. But Peter, the word says, followed afar off. He wanted to see what they were going to do with Jesus. And while Jesus was going from court to court, and it could be seen from the outside uh, we find that Peter was in the crowd looking on. And somebody said, hey, uh, uh, aren't, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? And, and Peter said, not me. Not me. No, 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 you've got me mistaken. For somebody, a, a few moments later, it says somebody else said, you're one of them. You're one of those disciples. And Peter denied again. And he said, you're making a mistake. I don't even know the man. And the third time, somebody said, you are one of them. For your speech your, gives you up. Uh, your, 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 your dialect is as a Galilean. You're from Nazareth as Jesus was. And Peter, the word said, he began to curse and he began to swear and said, I don't know this man, Jesus. And just at that point, the word says that the cock crowed. And it was then that Jesus, the word says, turned and in the whole crowd put his eyes on Peter. And Peter saw Jesus. And the word says that Peter went away and he wept bitterly. He was sorry for his sin and for the wrong. But don't you know that because he was sorry, Jesus forgave him. You can read further about that as you get into the word of the Lord. Think also, not just about Peter, think about the parable that Jesus told. We talked a little bit about it last week. Uh, that of the prodigal son. I'm talking about confession and contrition. Confession and being sorry for your sins. The prodigal son, the word says, when he came to himself, that he thought about the servants back at the father's house, having enough to eat and to spare. He said, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I acknowledge my sin. I confess my sin. But he said in his contrition, his sorrow, make me just as a hired servant. I don't deserve, I'm not worthy to be your son or just make me as a servant. But we know how that parable turns out and how it ends that the father who represents God forgives a contrite heart where there's confession and where there is sorrow, God indeed 
forgive. Look at the parable again that was read a little bit earlier on today from the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus, Jesus told the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector going up into the temple to pray in that 18th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And as they were there, uh, the parable says that two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed thus with himself and said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Now, now doesn't that go back to what uh, Jeremiah was saying? Let every man examine himself. Uh, here's this Pharisee uh, uh, examining the faults of somebody else. He says, I thank you I'm not like other men and extortioners and unjust and, and, and adulterers. I'm not even like this tax collector. The tax collector was a sinful man because tax collectors stole from the people in collecting taxes. But this Pharisee was comparing himself with somebody else going into the temple to pray. No, when we repent, we are to examine ourselves, confess our sins, and be contrite about our sins. The man said, I fast and I give tithes of all that I possess. But look at the tax collector. Jesus in the parable says that the tax collector stood afar off and would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven but beat his breast and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's contrition. That's sorrow. This man, the tax collector, was confessing, acknowledging he was a sinner, but he couldn't even look up to heaven, but in his heart and in his mind, he said, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. Oh, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said in the parable that this man went to his house justified more than the other. In other words, being justified because he was not just acknowledging his sins, but he was sorrowful for his sins. He was justified, that means that he was declared righteous. God looked upon him as being a righteous man. In spite of all that he had done, no matter how much he had stolen, the Lord forgave him because he repented of his sins. He confessed and then he was sorry indeed for his sins. When, when uh, we confess our sins and when we are contrite, it makes all the difference in the world in our relationship with the Lord. It is then that the Lord will forgive. The Lord forgives. The Lord declares you to be righteous. He declares you to be righteous. Paul said as we close from Romans 5 and verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Being justified by faith, that's Romans 5 and 1, being justified by faith, being declared righteous because of our faith in God and our faith in his son Jesus as our Savior. Our faith in the fact that God forgives a true repentant heart, one who comes to him with a broken and contrite spirit. Paul says we have peace with God. And that peace with God is not talking about a feeling of peace. It's talking about a legal standing with God. In other words, peace with God, meaning that God is on your side. Legal standing. God is on your side. That you are a child 
of the king. That's legal standing. That, that there is nothing that separates you from God. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, in church, we ought to long for peace with God. I don't know about you. I don't want to have any trouble with God. I don't want trouble with God. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to be on the outside looking on the inside. I don't want to have to face God's wrath and God's judgment. I want to be accepted by God, not rejected by God. Saul was rejected because he rejected God. God accepts those who accept him and who will live and lead according to his word. Not what we think things ought to be. There's somebody who knows a little bit better than we know. Not just a little bit better, but a whole lot more and a whole lot better than we do, and that's God himself. We find when we have peace with God that the Lord indeed is our friend. We ought to appreciate the friend we have in Jesus. So the invitation to you today is, won't you give your life to him? If you, if you, looking for a better and for a stronger, more complete relationship with the Lord, repent of your sins. Confess your sins. Be contrite. Show contrition. Show sorrow for your sins. The Lord knows what's in your heart. He said he saves those who are of a contrite heart and those who have a broken, a poor spirit. The Lord will bind that and will fix that and will lift you to be the son or daughter that he would have you to be. You're invited to come if you've not given your life to the Lord to do so today so that you may have that peace with God. If you come today to join the church, to unite with the Lord, there'll be two standing here one on each side of our officers. Y'all can come now. And uh, as they, two of you can come. Uh, as anyone should desire, one more person can come. Thank you. As you may come to unite with the church, I say to you to let either one of these know that that's why you're coming. And they'll take care of it from there. If there are any without a church home, maybe you've been a member of a church before, but for some reason have strayed from the Lord or strayed from church, and you desire now to renew, to rededicate your life to the Lord, you too may come, and the Lord will receive you. If there is any desiring prayer for whatever your needs may be today, we'll bow in prayer with you that your needs be met. Let us stand, and whosoever will, let him come. Let him come. your burdens and you brought your pain oh yeah oh yeah but I have a message for you today oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and when you leave here you won't be the Been to your position. 